Good afternoon, everyone. It's now 1 o'clock, and it's time to start the second Responsible Travel and Tourism Forum webinar for 2013. This is our second webinar in our series of six for 2013. I am your host, Andrea Dixon. I'd like to extend a warm welcome back to our regular participants, both from previous years and also from our first webinar two weeks ago. For those of you who are just joining us for the first time today, welcome. We're thrilled you could be here today. And just to let you know a little bit about the Responsible Travel and Tourism Forum, it is designed to engage the industry in continuous responsible tourism learning. And that's what I hope to do today. Ah, there. I was having trouble moving my slide. So as usual, I never want it to become stale, though. I'd love to extend a sincere welcome and thank you to our series sponsors. As you can imagine, nothing is free, well, except for participants listening in on here. But Without our sponsors, we would not be able to hold these webinars. So thank you to them for believing in the work that we do here at RTTF. And our sponsors are Air Canada, the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson, Eaton Chelsea, and of course, Baxter Travel Media. And I also want to thank our speakers who are on standby. They are giving their time and sharing their knowledge. So a huge thank you to you guys. And finally, to you, the participants. I mean, you give your time. I know there's lots of other things you could be doing. So thank you for your input and your enthusiasm. Really appreciate it. Now, I just want to say, uh, talking about input, we had a, a participant from Webinar 1, Gail Henry, who wrote to us after the program, after the webinar, and shared a great resource that I thought was really valuable and I thought everyone else would benefit from it. If you haven't listened to the first webinar, all you have to do is go to rttf.ca and you can listen to uh, the archived webinar there, and so and then you'll know what I'm talking about right now. But there's the website, it's destinet.eu. If you go to that and then go to that page underneath it, you'll find, um, uh, well, they describe it as a one-stop shop window to all certification programs and awards worldwide. So it kind of addresses that problem we were talking about in the webinar about where do you go to find out about all those certification programs, and, you know, which ones are good and which ones aren't. It doesn't have all the certification programs, but it's a really nice uh, summary of the big ones, like Travel Life was there, for example, the one we've talked about. So if you go there, you'll get a synopsis of um, each program and where you can go to find more. So it's one of the best resources I've, I've seen. So thanks, Gail. I really appreciate you writing to us. And I encourage anyone, uh, if you ever have resources or input like that, just send it to us. We're really, that's great. So I want to go over to our webinar series for this year. We've already done September 18th. As I mentioned, it's archived. You can go there at any time. There's our outline. Our one today, of course, is we're talking about a, a sensitive topic, or kind of a hot one, too. It's called Fair to All, Ensuring a Sustainable Future for Local People and Animals. And then coming in just two weeks, and, and look at, please, all the dates there. Usually they're every two weeks, but we kind of have one, well, October 30th and then November 6th. They're just one week apart. So if you can look at your calendar, mark them on your calendar, and sign up for them, that would be great. So the one in two weeks is kind, called Gaining an Edge by Finding a Sustainable Niche. This one will be jam-packed. As I mentioned last two weeks ago, I guess, we're trying to fit in three speakers. But it's going to have lots of practical information on how to set yourself apart by building a niche for yourself. So please, uh, for all these webinars, please spread the word to your friends and colleagues. The more participants you have, the more the issue of sustainability is advanced and our sustainable community, uh, tourism community builds here in Canada. And, and that is you know, really one of our big goals, is to get the community growing bigger and stronger. Now, for today, we have two great speakers. I mentioned today's topic is a bit of a sensitive one, but here to help answer your questions and address the concerns that your clients may have, we have two experts, and we're really, really grateful that they could share their time and knowledge. The first from England, I'd really like to welcome Judy Mill Julie Middleton. Julie is the Travel Foundation's Industry Programs Manager. Her role is to help travel companies adopt responsible practices through training, the development of toolkits, and other business support. She's going to tell us a lot more about the Travel Foundation. Um, we don't have the similar program or organization here in Canada, but we can use their resources, and they're all free, so that's great. We also have Christian Walters from Intrepid, an amazing tour operator. Christian is the VP of Sales and Marketing for Intrepid Travel in Toronto. He has over 17 years of experience in sales, marketing, and business development. And to understand all that he's done, look at his bio and look at Julie's. It's on RTTF's website. And I think if you go there, you'll find some interesting background about Christian and maybe some Harley-Davidson uh, background too. I will be moderating the session. 
Both speakers will take about 20 minutes. Then we'll do Q&A around 1.50. And I guess that's pretty much it. Oh, just for the uh, webinar etiquette, questions, yes. Questions, we love them. Please type them in during the presentation. They'll pop up. I will moder be moderating them. If you could direct them to a speaker, that would be really helpful um, because I have to pick and choose who they go through. So if you really want to say, Julie, you know, you want to know more about this, if you could put their name in there, that would be really, really great. But if not, no worries. And right now, I'm going to turn it over. Hello. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say how delighted I am to have the opportunity to talk with you all about this subject of fairness for animals and people in destinations. But before we go into all of that, I just want to give you a very brief introduction to the Travel Foundation. So um, the Travel Foundation was founded in 2003, and we work really closely with the UK outbound travel industry to make tourism more sustainable. We're an independent charity, and our funding comes through corporate donations, customer donations and grants, and we work with many different industry partners, including tour operators, travel agents, ground agents, hotels, and NGOs. Our work is all about protecting the environment and creating opportunities for local people in tourism destinations. So how do we go about doing this? Well, we set up projects in destinations to test new ways of working, and the successful projects are expanded and replicated. We then take what we learn and turn them into tools for the industry, which enables us to support companies to integrate responsible practices into their businesses. And the feedback and the ideas we get from our network of partners helps guide us on what projects we need to undertake next. Um, our projects are currently spread throughout the world in Europe, Africa, South and Central America, Asia, and the Caribbean. Over the 10 years we've been, uh, been around, we've funded or managed and supported 55 projects within 24 destinations. And our major influence has been in the destinations that are listed here. I think you'd agree that we've, the results have been pretty impressive to date. We know we've made a significant positive impact to the lives of communities and the environments of the popular tourist destinations. And if you want to find out more about our projects and the destinations in which you work, you can do so by visiting our, our website. So let's get on to the main business of today. What makes a holiday fair at all? And I want to start by telling you the story of two families. Holiday A is the Jones family holiday. There's a mum and dad and two kids. They book their annual holiday through their local agent, two weeks in an all-inclusive hotel on an island resort. When they get there, they find that the fittings and furnishings are international, and there's nothing about it to reflect the destination they're in. And when they go down, when they go down to dinner in the evening, they find that the food is all of an international variety, um, and there's not really much choice. When they step out of the hotel, they're hassled by the local traders trying to sell them things so they quickly retreat back inside. And at night, when they go down for the entertainment, they're horrified when a roller skating parrot performs as part of the, of the evening. They are animal lovers, and they know the parrot must have been treated cruelly in order to perform these kinds of tricks. They also find the staff are really quite rude and surly, and they're always telling them that they're tired. And when they do eventually put the courage up to go outside, they find that the local shops are full of souvenirs that are made in China. So now let's look at Holiday B, the Smith family holiday. Mum, Dad, and two kids, they book their annual holiday through their local agent, two weeks in an all-inclusive hotel on an island resort. 
resort. When they get there, they're delighted to find that the hotel is furnished in a way that reflects the local character of the area with little artifacts in every room. And when they go down to dinner, they find that the food is, is local, it's from the region, and they know this because there's signs all over the buffet telling them so, and even how many food miles that the food has travelled. The, the hotel provides cocktails made with local liqueurs and lots of information on what to do locally so that the family are able to get out and about and visit the local market. They even provide a solar-powered shuttle bus to get there. And when they go down to the beach, the beach boys approach them very nicely and offer them a menu of local tours. They make really good friends with the barman who tells them all about the wonderfully locally known places to visit. And when they book an excursion to see wildlife, the guide is a local guide and he tells them how to view the animals so as not to disturb them. And the Smith family have no problem buying local souvenirs as the hotel has a nightly craft market inviting local producers in to sell their wares. So whose family holiday do we think is the most fair to people and animals? Well, the Jones family holiday certainly was not fair to that poor old parrot. But what about the people? Well, it's, it's really hard to say because if the staff were unhappy and miserable, it would seem likely they were not getting paid very well, maybe working long hours, not feeling very valued. If the food supplied was international, it could have been exported, which would mean local suppliers are not getting a fair deal, and likewise with the souvenirs. Certainly, hassle is almost always caused by the informal sector desperately trying to get a piece of the tourism action. But when we look at the Smith family holiday, we have a very different picture. The furnishings, the food, the crafts and souvenirs are all local, meaning local suppliers and producers are being utilised. The hotel staff are happy and engaged in their work. They're proud of their destination, which has the knock-on effect of encouraging the guests to go out and about and explore, which means they're spending their money locally on food and drinks and transport, excursions and crafts. The destination is obviously taking steps to protect the flora and fauna, which in turn makes it a more desirable place to visit. But, I think probably one of the most important things to take from the experience of, of these two families that it's the Smith holiday, the fairer one, which is the most, the more enriching vacation. It's providing the Smiths with wonderful memories to take home, to tell their friends about, and quite possibly to return to the next year. So. Whose responsibility is it to make sure everyone gets a fair deal in a, in a tourist resort? Well, of course, it's not that simple because it involves a whole range of stakeholders. And getting all of those stakeholders to work together towards a common goal is a massive undertaking. If we just take a few of the stakeholders in this list, we can see the complexities. Governments. Oh, dear, governments. They come, they go, their policies change. The huge bureaucratic machines often corrupt. And this means that local pe people often get an unfair deal. They can be thrown off their land because big international corporations want to build a resort there. Water can be diverted from villages to supply a, a hotel with enough to fill the jacuzzis. And then what about the tour operator? If they're driving down the prices when contracting with hotels and local agents, this can often have repercussions on quality and fairness. And then if a, if a hotel and a hotel, hotel owner and a hotel manager have very different viewpoints, the owner may be a foreign investor only interested in the bottom line. And then the bars, the restaurants, the craft producers, are they using local suppliers and are their products sustainably sourced? And then, of course, we have the visitor. Of course, in this day and age, with social media, apps, and smartphones, it's very easy for the visitor to make their views known, as is in this review on TripAdvisor. 
increasingly the visitor has the power to make or break hotels, restaurants and attractions. Research shows that although greener and fairer holidays are not the number one priority when it comes to booking a So this is where you come in. What can you do to make sure the holidays you sell are fairer to all? Well, let's have a look at how you work with the, with the tour operators. What are the policies and practices of the tour operators you are working with? Um, and what you can do here is to contact your key tour operator partners to request information about the way they're operating. You can ask them to highlight the product based on specific criteria, including fairness to people and animals, as a main criteria. Many mainstream tour operators are now offering differentiated green products. Here in the, K in the UK, we have Virgin Holidays that have produced a human nature collection, and TUI has a Holidays Forever brand. Um, specialist brands such as Intrepid, who are presenting next, make it very clear through all of their communications that responsibility is at the heart of their business. And then you can take the same kind of approach with hotels. So if you're looking at the hotels that are within in your portfolio, uh, are any hotel with, that has Global Sustainable Council certification, recognized certification, will have undertaken a thorough audit to assess the social impact of their business as well as the environmental. So uh, Andrea mentioned Travel Life in the in introduction. Travel Life is, um, is a scheme that has, has been recognized by the GSTC. So if you're selling a hotel that has Travel Life um, certification, you will know that it, it, it is being fair to people and animals. There's also increasing evidence to show that hotels with environmental and social certification score very highly on quality in customer feedback. Um, in fact, TUI undertook um, undertook research into this last year, where they analyzed their customer feedback um, questionnaires and found this to be this to be true. So again, what you have is very, very happy customers as a result of, of fair practice. And then looking at the at excursions, the Travel Foundation actually has a checklist for tour operators or ground operators to use when assessing an excursion to ensure that it's not impacting on the environment and provides benefits for local people. You can check with your tour operator partners to make sure they're using this or even adapt it for your own use and have your own checklist. Remember, it doesn't have to be something niche. It doesn't have to be um, a, a, a niche excursion. Even the most popular attractions can be fair to people and animals. For example, Disney World have very strong policies in place. So, what are some of the ethical dilemmas which may arise when selling holidays? Well, I think um, a lot of holiday makers find it very hard to refuse, refuse children begging on the street. But giving out money in this fashion does not really solve anything. It only just sets up more begging. Um, so you can really help by informing your customers of the best way to handle this, encouraging them to spend their money on locally made crafts and food. This is really the very best thing that they can do and so easy for them to do when they're, they're on holiday. But if they want to make a, a, a specific charitable donation, you can direct them to the right place. Animals um, often feature highly in the tourist industry as part of specialist tours and day excursions. In fact, it's growing. It's growing um, all the time. In fact, I think one major tour operator in the UK estimated last year that 70% of their excursions involved some kind of interaction with animals. And viewing wildlife can be a fantastic experience for holiday makers. 
but it can also be very damaging for wildlife if the highest standards of animal welfare are not adhered to. So it's therefore important that as an industry, we actively phase out activities that are detrimental to the well-being of animals, both in captivity and in the wild. And of course, there's lots of controversial issues. Is it cool to ride an elephant? Should we swim with dolphins? Even should animals be kept at, at captive at all? Um, ABTA, which is the Association of British Travel Agents, have recently launched a global welfare guidance for animals in tourism. Um, and they've produced this in conjunction with the Born Free Foundation. And we can certainly make a copy of this available to you. Because it's not, as with everything, it's not all black and white. But you may want to consider what ethical stance you want to take. And this leads us on very nicely to the next slide. So what do you do if a customer wants to do something you disagree with? Maybe swimming with wild dolphins. As a travel agent with the customer sitting right in front of you, you're in a unique, a unique position to explain to them why this is, in da this is damaging for dolphins and suggest another option. If you undertake to choice edit, it allows you to cut out unnecessarily damaging products and offer a selection of innovative and unique sustainable products over time. Um, and if you do decide to remove what was previously a very popular element of an excursion, it's really good if you provide explanations for customers about why that activity has been dropped from the portfolio. Customers are likely to be much more understanding if they understand the reasons for your action, especially if you can offer them an equally enjoyable and fairer alternative. So throughout this presentation, I've been mentioning our, the Travel Foundation tools. And they're freely available on our website. Um, and I'm sure Andrew will be sharing the link with you at the end of, of the webinar. They're really practical and easy to use, and they've been designed with people like you in mind. Many of us here at the Travel Foundation have come from industry backgrounds, so we know what it's like to be uh, in busy jobs like you. We know that to have a good chance of you using these tools, they have to be easy to apply. So that's why we've designed them that way. And we really hope that you'll take a look at them to help you with this subject and with numerous others of which we have tools for. So to conclude, um, if, you, if you want to play your part in being fair at all, then really it's time for you to draw up a plan. And the first thing I think you need to do is decide what you feel most comfortable with, probably to have a look at the guidelines, do the research, look at the guidelines that ABTA have produced on animal welfare, and decide what ethical stance you want to take. Um, and also, it's really important that as a company, you all get together and you agree that you take the same stance. I once was, visited a travel agent here in the UK where the boss had decided he would never sell Japan because he in Japan, they carry out whaling, and he didn't agree with whaling, and therefore would never sell a, a holiday to Japan. Uh, yet when I spoke to the staff, they had no idea of this, and they were very happily selling holidays to Japan. So it's really important that you all agree, all take the same stance, and that you communicate to the customers in the right way, uh, in the same way so that they understand why you've taken the decisions that you have and 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 why it's important to you, and then it will probably be very that it will make sense to them. And then once you've done this, it would be good to use our tools to help you draw up a checklist. Um, and in the way that we've talked about, um, uh, the, uh, what, what uh, tour operators and hotels and excursions, you can draw up your own checklist so that you can decide which ones that you want to give priority to when you sell because you think they're fairer, uh, they're fairer to people and animals. And then let your customers know what you're doing and why you've decided to do it. I mean, this is really 
this is really where you guys are in a great position. You've got, you're seeing customers every day. You're in a wonderful position to educate them. And once customers are educated, um, that's when things change because they start demanding that. They start demanding that. So to really uh, make the world a fairer and place for animals and people, it's uh, it's it, you know it's great that we uh, we can take the lead, but it's lovely that our customers are demanding it too because that really makes it happen. And you never know; they may just respect you that little bit more for it. In fact, I'm sure that they will. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, thanks very much, all of you, for for listening, and I look forward to taking questions after Christian's presented his. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, congratulations on the job you're doing at Travel Foundation. Um, I encourage all participants to check out their free tools and. Regarding the document, the uh, ABTA's um, Global Initiatives on Animal Tourism, I will make sure, if it's not on the website, I'm not sure, I'll, t I'll check in with Julie though. And I am, my website or my email address is coming up at the end and people can email me or I'll figure it out with Baxter, but um, I imagine the easiest way will be for people to email me at andrea.dixon at ymail.com and I'll make sure anybody who wants that link or that document gets it because it, it sounds amazing. I can't wait to look at it myself. I'm very excited. Um, but yeah, Julia, thank you. Um, you really helped me understand the, the navigate the issue of fairness, you know, how to define it, who's responsible, which of course is so complicated, and just you know how to provide some answers to those ethical. Live intrepid. Um, for those of you who have listened to our webinar two weeks ago, I'd like to link it back and um, just because Christian is going to be touching a little bit on certification programs and how Intrepid uses them or not. So um, make sure you remember what you learned two, we two weeks ago. And, but specifically, Christian is going to be touching upon how Intrepid builds fairness into all of its products. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Christian, and then I will come back at the end. And please remember to type your questions. Um, writing them all down, so we'll get back to them at the after Christian. Thanks, Christian. Thanks so much, Andrea, and uh, very interesting presentation, Julia. It was great. Um, just, uh, I'll go very, very briefly over who the uh, who Intrepid is. Uh, we're part of the Intrepid group, and you can see in the slide a whole bunch of uh, different brands that you may or may not know that are part of the Intrepid group. Um, but I'm going to speak today specifically about some of uh, the practices that Intrepid Travel has practiced uh, over the the last few years. Um, if you don't know us, uh, what makes us different, or what uh, makes us a unique company, um, is that we offer small group tours all around the world. We're one of the largest um, small group tour operators, adventure tour operators. Uh, we do tours in all the continents in the world. Uh, our groups are um, 12 or less people, so on average 10 people. We use always um, local transportation, uh, local accommodation, and uh, we always offer our, our customers freedom and flexibility on our tours, so um, it's not a full day's itinerary where you have time to uh, take some time on your own to explore the, 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 your surroundings. Uh, we really believe in local interaction and, uh, of course, real value. But um, one of the aspects of Intrepid that I first was attracted to as a brand when I was, was looking for, for someone to work for was the fact of uh, how, how active uh, Intrepid is with responsible tourism. We've had an RT manager long before um, responsible tourism was a, a, a more common uh, term uh, for over 12 years now. And we've had a, a foundation uh, to raise money for, for projects. This slide I really like because it highlights um, the, you know, some of the things that um, Intrepid has done over the years. So, um, first of all, because we use local transportation, local guides, local accommodation, purchase local food, $60 million have uh, been pumped into local economies. Um, we use public transport, uh, which um, 
significantly reduces our passengers' carbon footprint. And uh, what we don't reduce, we actually offset 100% on our land, uh, land portion of our tours. In 2012, we invested over $250,000 in renewable energy programs in India, China, Brazil, and Thailand as part of our offset program, which I'll go into a little bit further. Uh, the Intrepid Foundation is our charitable arm, and uh, we've raised, uh, on our 10th anniversary, we raised 427000 We're close to $2 million, which are being injected to over 60 projects uh, around the world, um, which is quite exciting. On the home front, um, the Intrepid uh, headquarters, we don't just uh, think about what we're doing on the ground, but we're also, like in marketing and sales offices like the one I'm sitting in, we're also actively taking measures to reduce our car carbon uh, CO2 emissions, so we've been reducing those by 21%. Our travelers offset 2,223, uh, sorry, 2,234 tons of CO2 through our carbon offset flight program. Uh, obviously, we're encouraging people to carbon offset their flights. Um, so that's a, that's a lot of flights. Um, animal welfare, uh, we love elephants. So we funded uh, research by wildlife experts. Um, we've gone to the experts to, to give us advice on best practices, pra practices like the WSPA. And uh, I'm going to get a little bit into greater detail about uh, specifically about elephant welfare. Um, and the, the main thing is that with all these practices, um, it hasn't been detrimental to our operations. In fact, it's augmented our, our customer experience. So like when Julie was talking about the, Swiss, the Smith family enjoying these practices, I think it's quite clear for us as well that 4.7 out of 5 have given uh, uh, basically given a very positive rating. Um, the fund didn't stop here. We made a commitment to support global uh, gender equality through Project SAMA. Uh, 60,000 was raised just this year, um, and 2,000 people have been educated about gender equality issues around the world. Um, we're also pretty excited because we've won a couple of awards, like the Condé Nast um, World uh, Savers Award, uh, the Green Lifestyle Awards. Um, even, even the Moroccan government have given us awards, but we've uh, done quite well in a lot of local, um, local uh, award programs. Um, just a very quick outline of what we do on the CO2 emissions is basically back in um, 2006, our leader, uh, Daryl Wade, uh, realized that you know because we're operating tours, we are emitting a lot of CO2 emissions. So he put us on a program to be 100% carbon offset on our, our, our tours uh, by 2010, and it was a big undertaking, and we've done it, and, and ever since, all of our tours have been 100% carbon offset. Um, so even if there's a flight in the middle of the tour, that is offset as well. Then we encourage our customers that fly in to uh, be carb to take to carbon offset their flight as well. Um, some interesting numbers uh, on carbon offsetting. Um, uh, only four of our carbon offset trips are more than a dollar a day, so it's really not costing the customers any more. A uh, significant uh, outlay of cash to be CO2 uh, offset, which is quite exciting. And some of them is low, some of our tours are as low as 56 cents uh, for the entire departure, because um, literally we offset everything. So if, even if you're on a full hiking trip and you use a gas stove, we offset the CO2 emissions emitted by the gas stove. 32 trips are less than $10 per departure per passenger, and 21 trips are less than $5 per departure per passenger. So it's quite, a, quite an effective program. Um, we don't disclose the, the, these costs to the public, but um, we like to tell uh, our customers how much CO2 emissions uh, per passenger per departure uh, have been um, offset. And we do talk about quite actively about the programs that we um, fund with our carbon offset dollars, um, so it's quite quite good in that regard as well. But just some thoughts. Um, uh, the RTTF asked uh, me specifically a few questions to answer, and I thought I'd just answer them directly um, and, and go through that. So how do you know an excursion or an activity really follows or practices what it preaches? Um, I think this is a, you know, a question that um, we've, strug we've struggled on how to communicate this to our customers, but I can understand that there's so many travel options, so many products, everyone's banging the green drum these days. How do you know it's all real or is it just marketing talk? Um, so first of all, uh, it's largely a matter of trust um, of what the uh, operator is doing and basically what you're gathering from passenger feedback. Um, 
like um, you know, like we saw from uh, the TripAdvisor slide that uh, Julie put up, travelers won't hold back on voicing when a product doesn't match or claim what's what's been promised. Um, so that's really really key as well. And um, you know, Intrepid believes truly believes uh, truth in marketing and um, and our performance on the ground are key to ensuring a customers really trust us. If they're not satisfied and they're not having their expectations met, then uh, we're not going to be selling more tours. Um, our customers are very, very eco-conscious, so we have to have all of our ducks in a row on this. Um, generally, um, the next question is, what is the definition of a sustainable attraction or excursion or an activity? Well, I think there's, um, you know, there's, there's multiple points to this definition. I think, first of all, the attraction or the excursion of the activity should be assessed for its impacts. A sustainable attraction um, or an activity is one that is assessed uh, uh, frequently and its capacity frequency is managed so that the impacts will not prevent the same activity to be able to be replicated or operated many years into the future. We need to make sure that, you know, it's, it makes business sense for us to be sustainable in order for us to operate in that area. If a, a place gets overrun, uh, mismanaged, it doesn't become an attractive location to visit and we can't ro operate tours anywhere. So there's no benefit on to our bottom line, let alone what we think is, is um, ethically and morally correct. Um, the also, the, you know, the final point is negative, neg your negative impacts that the tour or the excursion of the activity, should, they should always be outweighed by the positive impacts um, to the community and not adver be adversely detrimental uh, to the local communities and to generations to come. Um, you know, a, a local village should benefit because of your tours visiting. Uh, regretfully, some of the big box hotels, they never see those money. So that's why you know, contributing locally is so key in these, in these matters. Um, the next question uh, that I thought I'd tackle is, are there specific things you would recommend? Um, you know, what would we recommend to look for to verify what is being claimed? I mean, generally, it, there's no, I don't think there's just one generic stamp out there that says, you know, uh, this, this tour operator, this hotel, this tour, um, this, this destination, in fact, uh, does say what it does. But basically, what you need to do is do a little bit of investigating. Um, claims on the website and literature should be supported with evidence and examples. Um, any doubts? Ask their customer service. Um, if you're not getting the answers, move up the line. Uh, talk to the managers. Um, I would never trust what a company says on the first page of their brochure. Really dig into what they're saying. Try to really understand, and uh, that way you know exactly what's happening. Um, can there really be such thing as a sustainable golf course or a ski hill? And how do you answer clients' questions about these? And this is a difficult one for me. I'm not a, I'm not a golf course uh, expert, but generally, um, you know, Intrepid Travel uh, promotes real-life experiences in communities, and we do not specialize in, in, in activities like this. But our, our outdoor activities are generally low-impact ones like walking and kayaking and rafting where we do all the pos where, where we do at the most to minimize our footprint to the natural, uh, natural environment. My, my philosophy here is that um, if there's someone that is keen, really keen on golfing um, and that's what they want to do, I wouldn't turn them away because you may have, um, you know, may think that golf courses are terrible. But I try to point them to where you think if there are some activities uh, that are more sustainable. Uh, maybe there is a golf course out there that um, is practicing greener measures. So at least you're steering them to the golf courses that care more. Um, I know there's a golf course here just outside of Toronto, um, which is on the Ork Ridges Moraine, and they, they've made a point to reuse and re-irrigate the water that uh, they, they have and not con uh, continuously draw water from uh, the aquifer. Um, I'm not saying this is 100% um, a sustainable practice, but it is a better, better golf course to visit than others if, um, if your customers are concerned. And I think what it does is it, it encourages um, positive, um, you know, uh, basically positive actions by these golf courses. Um, and then that way other golf courses that are losing, losing business will see that this is the right thing to do and the right steps to make. But uh, like I said, uh, you know, 
uh, golf courses are not our expertise. Um, but one thing that Julie did bring up, uh, you know, like the roller roller skating parrot, um, we've had a we've had a, a little bit of an internal ethical dilemma over riding elephants. Um, in, in, when I say internally is that um, you know, our customers have continually said we love riding elephants, that's why we want to go to Thailand or India or Africa where they have elephants. And uh, so some people who are very concerned about our sales were very concerned that we would potentially be pulling the plug. Um, so we did have a big debate about it, and I think we came to this conclusion. So, I mean, in general, like, who doesn't love to see elephants during their travels? Um, but sadly, many of these experiences are not positive for the animals, um, and their welfare is very, very compromised for this activity. During uh, 2010 and 11, Intrepid Travel lent support to extensive research in Asia, in Asia concerning the welfare of captive elephants conducted by the World Society for the Protection of Animals, the WSPA. The research looked at wildlife entertainment venues and assessed the welfare of the elephants, monkeys, and tigers housed there. We've learned uh, a lot since that time, and specifically about elephants, that we'd, um, you know, generally we've been actively sharing with our travelers on our, on our website. You can see there's a, uh, there's a PDF that you can download all about this, and this is actually, this slide uh, captures some of that PDF. Um, but um, you know, we basically don't ride elephants or patron. We, we don't encourage our customers to ride elephants or patronize shows where the elephants are clearly made to perform unnatural or human-like activities. Um, and we, we generally encourage our customers and customers that are going to these areas to, to voice their, uh, their voice their concern, concerns to authorities. Um, in general, if you want to help elephants or experience them at close range, um, you know, please only support commendable venues, or at least a venue that clearly prioritizes the elephant's welfare. Intrepid um, has lots of suggestions. The existing captive elephant situation will require improvement, and by bringing support to better welfare-providing venues, this will preserve other venues to improve. Uh, this will encourage um, other venues to improve, while overall aiming to prevent new elephants from en ending up in this trade. Um, so we've, we, we, you know, you, you'll find that most of our tours now don't offer um, elephant riding experiences, but you get to experience the elephants close at hand. Um, there's a couple of, uh, there's an elephant hospital, for, for example, in Thailand that you get to visit. And every time I've talked to a customer um, that's experienced both riding an elephant or going to this elephant hospital, they always remember the elephant hospital and said it was so much more uh, gratifying uh, as, a, as a tourist uh, to visit that. Um, Going off of elephants, um, you know, what has changed in the last few years with respect to attractions and uh, excursions? Uh, and generally, I think travelers um, who are more envi are just more environmentally aware. Um, they're, you know, they're choosing sustainable options at home. Um, they they recycle. They choose renewable energy. They're growing their own produce. Uh, they're supporting not-for-profit organizations, so they, they basically bring this attitude uh, with themselves when they go abroad and, and, and with the uh, suppliers of uh, tourism that they choose. Um, so they're, incre they're basically increasing their, their, tra their, their, their travel options and choosing to travel in a way that is sustainable as possible, carefully considering various components of their holiday, from the travel means to the accommodation, to what tours they're using, what tour leaders, uh, offsetting flights, etc. Um, they're um, basically, Intrepid's market is, seek, is, is basically, basically seeking an authentic, uh, an authentic rather than a contrived or mass-produced experiences. So our travelers like to see and learn about local life. They don't want to see it from a hotel window or from a tour bus window. And they want to interact directly with, um, with the, uh, the locals. Um, it's so important for them to, to take public transit. Anytime they've taken, you know, while we, we say we're taking public transit because it's not as bad uh, to the environment or it's, it's putting money to the uh, local, the experience is just so much better taking a, a public transit. You really get to experience what the locals are trying. Uh, you get to experience their local traditions, their handcrafts, agriculture, etc. Um, so whether it's staying in an ethnic minority homestay in Western China or enjoying dinner in the home of a dervish in Turkey, um, you know, riding with the cowboys on a ranch in Argentina or cooking up a pasta storm in an Italian village, this is some of the activities that we like our customers to experience. Um, 
And um, you know, it, and now attractions and excursions need to meet these type of expectations because people are looking for an incredible experience. So um, you know, just the final um, final sort of outlook is does. Intrepid use a green certification, and do we point um, our customers to one specific green c certifier? We don't. Um, currently, right now, we're a, a signatory of the United Nations Global Compact. It's quite a lengthy document, but it outlines 10 principles in the areas of human rights, labor, the environment, and anti-corruption. So we follow this to the T. Um, animal uh, welfare is in there as well. And uh, we're very, very strict. Because we've signed it, we follow it to the T, and, um, you know, and it hits all these, these aspects. Uh, the other thing, um, we, we often apply to uh, third-party award programs uh, that uh, uh, basically companies or organizations that um, you know, take a good look at what we're doing as a company and then give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down depending on what they investigate. And uh, with Intrepid, they've been definitely giving us the thumbs up. Uh, Condé Nast World Savers Awards for the preservation category. Uh, we recently won the Green Lifestyle Awards. Uh, many other uh, regional awards, like for example, the very the RTTF's um, 2010 Responsible uh, Leadership Award, uh, which we were very proud to to earn back then. Um, I think just generally in in, in closing um, is that it's very very key um, that you, like I said, you investigate the company. The, regretfully, there's no single badge out there that just says this company is doing what they say and they're going to benefit the local communities, environment, and animals. Uh, but I think you just have to dig into what they're saying. Um, social media is an incredible tool for learning very, very quickly on the pros and cons with working with a company, not just on sustainability, but on, on, any, on every um, aspect, including customer service. So I, you know, I definitely encourage you um, as, as agents to look into all those type of activities and, and look at all those type, you know, make sure that they're doing what they're saying. And that's it for me. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I'm really pleased to, to learn about Intrepid and some suggestions you have on how to answer clients' questions and the dilemmas. Um, they're great. And I, um, yeah, I know when I was going down to, to Florida, it was not riding elephants, but um, swimming with the manatees comes up sometimes in Florida. And I used actually the Travel Foundation's um, guidelines toolkit to answer the questions to help choose the excursion provider for me, and it, they were fantastic, and they did a lot of the topics and um, items that you were talking about and Julie were talking about, and you know we, we wouldn't go into the reserves where the manatees are, we didn't touch the manatees, and uh, These are regarding people, local people, and animals, and um, and and use those tech, techniques that Christian and Julie have touched upon to, you know, maybe steal our steer our clients towards choices that are more fair for everybody involved. Um, yeah, but being clear in our own minds where we stand is really the start. And but having uh, these um, being able to answer their questions based upon you know Trepids and the Travel Foundation's experience and knowledge that's it's so helpful. So um, let's see. So we're so I need to talk about the next webinar and then we'll get into questions and answers. Our next webinar is finding a sustainable niche. It's not in the title, but you know I was thinking maybe we should have added a sustainable niche that is profitable. Um, I know if you're an agent that's listening, it's really important. It's nice to talk about sustainability, but we all have bills to pay. So the goal of this webinar is to convince you that it's possible to carve out a niche for yourself that is profitable. Um, so you know, I know when I had my agency, we'd hear from another agent in the agency would say, you know, you do all the research and the background work, and then they go and book online. But the lovely thing about sustainable tourism, and I hope to show you, is that why sustainable niches um, bring suppliers and clients where there's not the norm. So that's coming in two weeks. I would like you to sign up if you and encourage your um, your colleagues and friends and all that. But now we have a slew of questions, so I don't want to take up too much time. Um, right, I'll go to the next slide there. So getting back to the first, I guess, big item was the ABTA. Um, I was reading the comments there. You guys can read them as well. I'm understanding that travel or Baxter Travel Media will be coordinating, getting the information out to everybody. So um, this is the, um, 
Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to wrap you there, uh, Andrew, because this is it's up to the Association of British Travel Agents. Uh, okay. um, they they've produced these guidelines, and when I spoke to them last week, they said, "Is it CATA, your uh, Canadian Association of Travel Agents?" They would probably be able to make them available through them. Uh, um, but we we can also make sure that you've got a copy that, um, and it will be on our website too, so they'll be downloadable. Fantastic. But that's you know that covers just about everything you need to know about animals in the wild, in captivity, unrestricted. You know what what's that acceptable? What's um, and and really the things to look out for. Mm -hmm. Okay, that that's good then. So that it'll be available, and of course. In the next webinar, I'll touch base upon it too if anybody doesn't get the information in between. So that's great. Thank you for that. And Julie's um, website, the Travel Foundation, I'm, I'm sure if you just Google Travel Foundation, it'll pop up. The tools are there. They're downloadable. They're free. They're really good. And I think it addresses them. You know, Christian was talking about the golf courses and whatnot. They don't, and Travis doesn't use them that so much. But you, I know the Travel Foundation, and correct me if I'm wrong, Julie, um, you have an excursion question guideline or uh, attractions guideline. So, you know, if you, if an agent, someone wants to know, how to pick uh, an excursion that is responsible and fair, the good place to start is to go to the Fa Travel Foundation's website, take those toolkits, and, and use them and ask the questions. Um, and by asking questions, I think more and more suppliers who aren't um, up in the sort of fairer, uh, doing all the stuff that we would like them to do, they will realize that, that there is a demand, and they'll get maybe. I have a good answer for the golf course one. Oh, great. Why don't you take it away there? <laughs> Send them to Scotland because there's <laughs> plenty of water in Scotland. <laughs> they want to play golf. <laughs> 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 yeah. right there. All right. Not in the not in the desert. In the in the yeah yeah yeah. There's lots right. of water. <laughs> okay, so let's um getting back to the questions here. Okay, I know Julie. I do believe this one is for you. Um, Mark had asked about a, a zoo or aquarium. Do do they have a positive role to play? Um, I'm not sure if you. It depends really on, on how they're run, and I think if they're run well, they, then they have a huge positive ro role to play because they can educate people. Um, they can, it, it, a lot of people get their information about wildlife from zoos because it's the only, it's often the only place that they can, they go, they can get that from. Or, um, so it can help them to understand about animals and how they should behave around them if they end, ever end up in those destinations. Hmm. That's a good point, actually, yeah, because um, you know, especially for people who are just maybe living in Toronto or something, the, going to the zoo, you're right, is the one place they're going to be encountering those. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, and we also had a question um, about the Caribbean and Mexico and finding resorts that are fair. Um, I know there was some back and forth on the chat there too, which is great. I will try and compile all those answers. If anyone has other suggestions that you know of, um, feel free to send them to me and we can get a list going. I think Christian had said social media too. It's like um, those type of places, sharing this information is really key. Um, but Julie, do you know of any other place that where there might be a list of places in the Caribbean and Mexico that are really offer that fair, all-inclusive experience? That, um, you were speaking about? I I think, you know, what I was saying about the, the certification scheme is that's yeah. what you have to look for. Yeah. But I did see someone had actually said, you know, all-inclusive uh, customers tend to, to not leave their hotels. But um, we've actually undertaken some research to show that all-inclusive, in some parts of the world, all-inclusive customers actually go home with money that they haven't spent. They've taken money to spend, but they haven't spent it because they've not been able to find anything outside of the resort to spend it on, which shows that there is an opportunity, really, uh, that, that they are looking to go outside the hotels. And yeah. But it, where we've done the research, they've not found that opportunity. I use the all-inclusive example d deliberately in my Smith & Jones family to show that this can, you know, that, be, that fairness can Im apply in any type of holiday. Mm -hmm. Because it's true, because everyone thinks all-inclusives are, um, you know, a trip like Intrepid, you know that you're going to really have a fair holiday, but the all-inclusives sometimes don't generally pop 
top of mind as a fair holiday. So it's, um, yeah, that, that's very helpful. Um, and also your comment about tourists going home with money in their pockets. I've heard the same thing about up north in our, our northern tourism, the, the Arctic tourists. Um, is not well developed up there too, from what I understand, um, for the local souvenirs. And tourists up there would love to buy more local souvenirs, but where the, the boats go and stuff, it's not, um, there's not as many opportunities to, to spend them, to buy the purchase the products that they want to do. So yeah, I mean, hopefully that changes, so there'll be lots more local produced souvenirs. And OK, so let me do. Um, he heals, OK, I'm trying to. And we also had a question about elephant riding in Victoria Falls. I guess there they, they've been, they're orphaned, and so they're trained from a young age. I mean, I don't know if you can have any comment on that too, Julie, and sort of the whether that's fair or, or, or I guess it would be more Christian, sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking, getting it. So Christian, well, yeah. Yeah, I don't think that, I mean, I don't know the specific um, the specific uh, company that does that, so I don't, uh, you know, I don't know the, the story and the welfare. But, I, I, you know, we're we're extremely weary of those type of claims because you, you you know it begs the question: How were those elephants orphaned in the first place? And if they start becoming a business that requires elephants to perform, um, and they can't find uh, elephants that have been orphaned, how do they acquire elephants? Um, so gen generally, my message is just be wary of what they are claiming. Um, investigate as much as you can. It's difficult, I know, when you're on a trip and you, you come across this, uh, you know, before you would come across it, let's say, online or whatever. Um, but I generally, you know, ask the questions, and I think, you know, a lot of times you, you, you'll get a good understanding of, of, of where are these elephants and how they're being treated. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, as a company, we're very weary of it, and um, that's why we don't, uh, um, in, in almost all cases, encourage this type of activity. Yeah, no, I hadn't thought about that, about how they're open. That's a good point. And then um, Vicky has a question, too, for you, Christian. Um, what has been the customer feedback since your decision not to include elephant riding? Have you, do you think you've lost customers, or have you tracked that, or remained stable? Um, oh, it's it's definitely improved uh, because we we make a point to communicate, um, you know, basically what I communicated in in the presentation, but to our customers on the ground, and um, you know, it, you know, customers will, oh, I'd love to go on an elephant ride. Well, we don't provide this, and this is why, and uh, they love it because they have to, they they come home educated, and they can come back to their friends and family and say, hey, you know, like I didn't ride an elephant for five minutes, but I learned a lot about elephants. Um, the zoo that, or not zoo, sorry, the um, hospital in in Thailand that we visit, uh, they made the first world's first prosthetic limb for uh, elephants that get hurt uh, from landmines. Um, so that experience, you know, getting to see an elephant um, uh, in in this in this setting, it's it's quite touching and a lot more meaningful than a than a ride that you can literally get here in Canada even. Mm, okay. And wow, the, the questions are pouring in for you. Um, Christian, too, we have um, one from Magda. Christian, how can a sustainable hotel in a non-sustainable country approach Intrepid? I'm assuming she means like if she knows of a hotel, maybe how could it be part of um, Intrepid, or how does that work, or how do you pick your hotels, I guess? Uh, yeah, well, we have a, um, we have a, we have a lot of uh, ground operations. Uh, pretty well, we run, um, you know, 99% of our ground operations ourselves. So we have people, uh, you know, if we're talking about Peru, we do have um, uh, a Peru office, and uh, they are constantly investigating hotels, visiting the hotel owners, um, same thing with the tours and uh, every aspect of the tour, they're, they're constantly evaluating. We have a very formal evaluation process and uh, we ask all the, the, the questions um, that I think are, are very relevant um, to making sure that they're following uh, you know, ethical practice that uh, fits with our responsible tourism guidelines. Okay. Um, and I, I really encourage everyone to read the chat. I'm frantically reading it too. We have, thank you, Christine. You, you're putting up lots of links to um, all the things we're talking about. So um, people can just click on those to get more information. We're almost out of time. Um, just to get quickly, I have one here. Oh, 
Oh, Magnus says, what if it's not in Peru? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, that's like we have operate. I just uh, cited yeah. as one example, but we have ground operations all around the world. Okay. Um, so we do have uh, people that can answer that okay. and, and, and investigate that everywhere. And what about, are you, have to do, are you familiar with Elephant Friendly Tour in Thailand? Andrea is asking that, uh, not me, uh, another Andrea. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, what? Uh, um, in, in Thailand, do you know of any Elephant Friendly Tours in Thailand? I guess she might have a client there. Okay, I, I think that maybe would be a one that I can follow up on and, and okay. see if there's anything. Uh, um, I, I will share the, the website uh, for the Elephant Hospital, and um, there's also a, a very nice documentary that goes with that too. And, you know, guys, uh, it is actually 2 o'clock. I'm just looking at the time. So, um, unfortunately, we have to stop the questions, but we, you know, send me your comments, uh, send back your comments, and we'll follow up where we need to follow up. First of all, I want to say thanks to our speakers. You guys did an amazing job. Julie and Kristen, thank you so much for your insight and um, the resources. Thanks to our sponsors, Air Canada, Eaton Chelsea, Ted Rogers, School of Management, and Baxter. You guys do a great job. Participants, you guys stayed on. You have amazing uh, questions. You're engaged. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So I'm going to sign off now, and I just want to remind you that RTTF is to be continued. And thanks so much, guys. Talk to you soon. <laughs>